Είμαστε εντάξει με τον ήχο, με την εικόνα. Είμαστε okay με το sound. Can you all see us? Have you all heard which are the channels for the translation? You listen, you listen to English on channel 1 and Greek will be available on channel 2. Okay, so Christ has risen. Welcome. I'm here to make a very brief introduction and then I'd like to give the floor to His Eminence in order to kick off the works of this uh, meeting. Your Eminence, dear fathers, honorable professors, dear colleagues, friends of the Academy of Theological Studies, it is with great pleasure that we welcome you here in the city of Olos, the holy metropolis of the Mitriada, and the Academy of Theological Studies on the occasion of the Organization International Conference entitled Saint Simeon, the New Theologian, Interdisciplinary Approaches to the Theology of Light and Grace. For those of you coming for the first time, allow me to make a brief introduction to our academy. Our academy that celebrates 22 years of uninterrupted operation and since 2014 is a state acknowledged research center, operates as an open workshop of thinking and dialogue between the church and intellectuals and the society organizing annual thematic cycles of education, international seminars, conferences and editions. To this end, we collaborate with various academic and scientific bodies, ecumenical and interreligious organizations, civil society bodies, publishing houses, scientific journals, thus rendering Volos and the Metropolis of Dimitriada a place of discourse. And our academy has been widely known mainly due to its modern topics that addresses as well as the efforts that we have been making for many years in order to promote a critical dialogue between orthodoxy and modernism, orthodoxy and modern, postmodern world, orthodoxy and nationalism, orthodoxy and politics, human rights, as well as about the general discussion regarding the relation between orthodoxy and democracy, the state and the church, orthodoxy and science, theology and modern literature, as well as the position of a woman in church, the renewal of a religious affairs subject at schools, meaning that we try to approach all aspects of orthodox tradition. However, throughout those years, apart from highlighting a modern set of topics on orthodox theology, our academy has not neglected the traditional agenda. I'm talking about topics that are directly linked to biblical and patristic studies, organizing conferences that allow us to exercise criticism on the text and the hermeneutics of the New Testament, or such as was the case throughout the years 2013-2017, we organized annual patristic theology and patristic seminars lectures thanks to the Virginia Farrah Foundation support. And the organization of this conference entitled Saint Simon the New Theolo Theologian Interdisciplinary Approaches to the Theology of Light and Grace falls under this initiative. And we organize that for the millenary anniversary since the saint's domission in order to honor the personality, the theological thinking, and his contribution to orthodox spirituality. Holding this international conference in the Academy of Theological Studies at Volos reflects the renewed over the past decades interest of the theological and the academic world on the Christian spirituality of the East. And it is a critical, crucial point when we see the change of the first mi millenary as well as its influence on the modern Christian ecumenical reality. The renewal of interest regarding the study of the work and thinking of St. Simon the New Theologian has brought forward a series of all timely issues that are relevant to all the Christian world. The relationship between institution and charisma, sacraments and asceticism, the understanding of faith and doctrinal teaching as content of personal consciousness, the anthropology of theosis, as well as the highlighting of the Christian subject and its, his or her responsibility within 
the ecclesiastical body are just a few samples of the points of concern. We try to reposition these issues under the light of the critical operation of theology, and we try through a constructive interdisciplinary discourse among distinguished speakers university professors and experts and researchers from universities and research centers from Greece and abroad with the contribution of theology, literature, history, and social sciences. In general, our conference will focus on how we can take stock of the contribution of St. Simmons in theological literature, monastic spirituality, and the ecclesiastical life. In particular, our topics will shed light on the position of St. Simeon in the Byzantine literature as a poet and an author. They also try to explore his relation with the previous tradition of Eastern monastic spirituality. Thirdly, we seek to depict the monastic nature of the, his time. Fourthly, we analyze the theological thinking regarding the vision of God and the theosis of man. And fifthly, we try to see which are the eschatological extensions that stem from his work. It is with these few thoughts that I welcome you in these conferences. I'd like to welcome both the speakers and all the participants. I hope that this will be a fruitful collaboration and a creative exchange of ideas. And I also wish you a pleasant stay in the city of Olos. Before rest in my case, allow me to warmly thank everyone who has contributed to the setup and implementation of this conference. First of all, His Eminence, Metropolitan of Dimitriada, Mr. Ignatius, for his uninterrupted co- confidence and support. Everyone, and I mean literally everyone, of all the Academy of Theological Studies Associates. There are many, you can see all the names on this uh, annual program distributed to you. I'm sure that if I if I attempt to name them all, I will forget some and don't want to do that. So all those names are available on the annual brochure of our academy. I'd like to thank them for their restless efforts and continuous struggle for the best possible organization of this conference. I would also like to thank my scientific associates, Theotrilo Sabadzidis and Nikos Kouremenos because they willingly undertook the scientific and organizational aspects of this conference. If it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for their knowledge of the topic, we wouldn't have been standing here today. I would also like to thank the staff of the Conference Center Thessalia for their continuous technical support, our interpreters, because if it wasn't for them, it would have been difficult to communicate and interact, as well as our technicians who ensured the live broadcasting of the conference in both languages. This broadcasting will be available throughout the three days of the conference from all around the globe. A few days after the end of the conference, it will also be available on our YouTube channel. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the speakers of this conference for accepting our invitation, taking the trouble to travel, prepare, and come with us, joining us in order to share critical and essential material that will help us hold this fruitful discussion. I'm wishing every success of this conference. Again, welcome to the city of Olos, to our metropolis, and the Academy of Theological Studies. Thank you. Μετά λοιπόν αυτά τα σύντομα εισαγωγικά θα παρακαλέσω το σεβασμιό του. So I would like to call to the floor his eminence the metropolitan of Dimitriada who is also the president of the board of our academy. Please join us on stage in order to give your opening speech. I'm very happy because I'm able again in to talk in a physical conference. It is a great pleasure, a great experience. Venerable fathers, professors, dear participants, it is with great pleasure that we, em- we embark on this three-day international conference entitled San Simeon, the New Theologian, Interdisciplinary Approaches to the Theology of Light and Grace which is organized by our academy on the occasion of the millenary anniversary of the Domitian of the Saint. Volos Academy for Theological Studies, operating as an 
open lab for reflection and dialogue with scholars and society intervenes in the modern theological, ecclesiastical, and social historical conditions, making the most out of the patristic tradition and the ecclesiastic and theological heritage. The need to study pat pateric, patristic theology under the light of current problems and requirements is the link between the in research interests of the Academy to history and tradition of our church. And at the same time, it is the springboard to criticism and fruitful, constructive focus on this tradition in its effort to establish a dialogue with the priorities and needs of our era. The turn during these last decades to the study of the thought of San Simeon, the new theologian, confirms the care of theology for spirituality and life in Christ as the anthropological traits that are called upon to engage in a dialogue with the modern anthropologic standard, standard to engage in a dialogue with secularization and difference towards religion, but also the existential concerns of modern people. This dialogue must be honest, must be sincere. It should refrain from stereotypes of either side. That's the only way to have a fruitful dialogue and highlight the importance of the Christianic message for the generations to come. The general axis of this conference serve, in our opinion, this theme. The evaluation of the contribution of San Simeon in theological literature, monastic spirituality, and in general, church life. The analysis of the theological th thought of the saint when it comes to vision of God and theosis of man. also highlights the whole human, its body and its soul, and highlights the anthropology of theosis as an open challenge today. The vertical created by the experience of an anthropological model free of, uh, based on repentance, based on prayer, free of individualism, free of partiality, free of self-existence, free of self-reference. -re so this is the proposal of the uh, orthodox theology in its dialogue with the modern world. And this proposition is deeply rooted in the theology represented by San Simeon. But this proposition must again be made current by modern theology in order to meet modern people. With these thoughts, let me welcome you to the beautiful city of Volos. I wish all the best. I wish success to this conference. It is a big responsibility to bring San Simeon in dialogue with modern people. May you all be blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence, for your introductory remarks, and thank you for your blessings. And we are all here in order to take up this responsibility, to take up this mission. After the short, two short opening speeches, let's go to the heart of our conference, to the first session. Uh, please, Father Sabina, join us uh, on the panel. There are three speeches. Two will be broadcasted live through Skype. So the first speaker is by Barbara Crostini, adjunct professor in Byzantine Greek at the Department of Linguistics and Philology at the Uppsala University. She will talk about San Simeon, the New Theologian, and Syria, exploring Christian experiences at the turn of the millennium. 
Ms. Crostini, it is a great pleasure to welcome you in this conference. The floor now to you for uh, 30 minutes. So I'm very grateful uh, to the organizers for having invited me to participate in this event. And unfortunately, for health reasons, I could not travel to Volos, which is uh, a great pity. I am speaking to you from uh, Sweden, and uh, it's a feast day here today. So I wish you all a happy feast of the Ascension. Now, give me one second to share my screen. Um, and here, let's see. I put this big. I hope you can all see the screen and see me. So um, some speakers begin their paper by declaring that their talk is a work in progress, something that can be taken for granted in all research. By contrast, I would like to describe this paper as a work in regress. By this, I mean that the paper looks back in two ways in a personal way and in a research-oriented way. I am no expert on Simeon the New Theologian, so I look forward to learning much more about him from the other speakers during the conference. But I hope that, although there is much I need to learn from you, something of what I will say in this first paper of the conference can resonate with your much more detailed and expert knowledge of Simeon's writings and theology. The personal way in which this paper looks back is to my own past as a researcher of Byzantine monasticism, which began with my doctorate on the Catechetical of Paul of Evergetis, another 11th century hegumenot and writer in urban Constantinople. Although my doctorate remained unpublished, um, I have kept thinking about this foundation and its purpose, in particular about its relation to the Studios Monastery as well as about its role as a center of copy of parchment manuscripts. Although belonging to a slightly earlier period, Simeon the New Theologian is concerned with both these aspects. Um, so I uh, addressed uh, neither of these issues when I compared Paul and Simeon in the acts of the 2002 Bose conference, and you see the cover of that book here. Simeone il Nuovo Teologo e il Monachesimo a Constantinopoli. Um, and this paper today opens up a, a completely different horizon going, um, going towards Syria. But I will come back to these two points, the Monastery of Studios and Manuscripts. My paper also looks back from a research point of view by connecting Simeon, the new theologian, with late antiquity. Just as it is difficult to pinpoint the parting of the ways between Jews and Christians, and now scholars talk about ways that never parted, so is it arbitrary to establish when late antique was replaced by the medieval, especially in Byzantium. So scholarship has realized that to hypothecate the activity and beliefs of generations of early Christ believers on our own ecclesiastical models is at least methodologically dubious. One problem is that the varieties of Christianity, the Christianities as they are called now, that provide a new spectrum for understanding the early Christian movement reflect a valuable plurality only if each of them can be considered meaningful and yet, there is still much resistance to imagining scenarios that differ from our own way of doing things. And here I would like to show continuities that do exist between Simeon and Syriac Christianity, but also I would like to understand them in an anthropological framework <clears throat> as part of the Christian or just of a general religious experience um, rather than as a series of the same phenomena. <clears throat> so I will uh, talk about Nikita's life of Simeon, especially uh, where um, the literary um, construct is a kind of distorting mirror for the reality. And this is true, especially of Byzantine literature, as we know. 
<clears throat> so when asked to speak about Simeon, I could have talked about Basil II, uh, the emperor who lived at the time of Simeon, 976 to 1025. But in that volume I showed you, there is an article by Marie-Hélène Congourteau that deals precisely with this issue. So I turned rather to the dynamic um, of the Byzantine capital at the turn of, of the millennium with respect to the situation on the empire's eastern frontier, of which you see here a map. Um, recent scholarship has turned to Arabic sources to tease out more details about the administration of provinces, such as Palestine and Syria, on the wave of Byzantine military successes uh, at the end of the 10th century, discovering a Christian ferment in regions lost, long lost to Islam. So beside the repeated sieges of Antioch, the cultural and intellectual center of Christianity since antiquity, there was the reconquest of Aleppo in 999 and the ensuing period of relative peace with the Fatimids um, that inaugurated a renewed Byzantine appropriation of the Syrian heritage, also spurred by the Syrian immigration to the capital that had been sort of ongoing already. Um, the revival of starlight cults, oh no, this is a wrong PowerPoint. I'm so sorry, this is not going to work. Oh dear, dear, dear. How am I going to do this now? Oh Lord, I'm sorry. <sighs> I, I have to uh, either read it to you without the images, which is a bit of a shame, uh, or I have to just see if I can find this quickly. I'm so terribly sorry. <sighs> Take your time, no problem. Take your time, please. Yes, I am really embarrassed. Okay. No um, but I don't know if if it managed to transfer in this, and I don't even know if it managed to transfer in this, um, um, in this, um, in this upload. I thought I had uploaded it, but it clearly still got the wrong version. Um, so, what shall we do? I, Simeon and Syria talks, this must be it. I'm so terribly sorry, we'll start again. Um, no, we won't start again, but I'll go forward. Okay. 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 Um, the revive thank you for your patience. The revival of stylite cults, evident among other things from their prominence in Basil's illustrated Medologian, is perhaps the clearest sign of this new trend. Uh, Nikephoros Uranos, Basil's general stationed in the east, and his friend Simeon Metaphrastes played a significant role in mediating this cultural transfer by orchestrating official versions of saints' lives, now written in high style for a learned audience. Like these performing saints on pillars, Simeon the new theologian, and note his name of course, belongs to the same sphere of a Syro-Mesopotamian style of Christian experience. On the other hand, he is at the same time, he at the same time spectacularly falls outside these efforts at homogenization. As others have pointed out, he is a kind of misfit when compared to contemporary saint making. This is particularly evident in his advocacy of a cult for his spiritual father, another Simeon called the Pious, through an image rather than a text. Simeon's origins in the Pontic region of Paphlagonia, but with roots in Galatia, if that is what Galati or Galatonis means said by the life about his parents, provided access to ancient Syrian culture. The Black Sea region had always been well connected to North Syria and Mesopotamia through trade and exchange. This scrap of painted leather covered the shield of a Roman soldier and was found at Dura Europos, 
it shows the distances along the Black Sea coast up to the Danube. In this paper, I argue that Simeon belongs to an ancient tradition of performative Christianity, whose vestiges are found at Dureuropos on the Euphrates. Not unlike initiates of mystery cults, the faithful are called to embody the divinity through ritual and paraliturgical actions. Faith is dramatized through emotional scenes that enact key spiritual messages, as for example in this fresco of Elijah resurrecting the widow's son from the Dura synagogue. This tradition developed within Babylonian Judaism, incorporated Eastern influences, and embraced a thorough Hellenization in line with the ideals of Alexander the Great's cosmopolitan empire. In contrast to rigidly defined faith tenets, during believers participated in salvation history by reenacting and developing biblical narratives in midrashic fashion for the purposes of instruction and emotional involvement, including visual aids such as wall paintings. Song et Lumière shows deeply affected the initiates and attracted masses of believers who responded to this apostolic call to healing and salvation. Syrian hymns sung in choirs of women remain as the epigons of this synesthetic experience that the ancient synagogue or church or assembly offered to all those who cared to step beyond its threshold. Like Simeon's hymns, such compositions were not liturgical in a formal sense. This religious culture was inclusive and fervent, but easily open to criticism, just as low-level and mass culture is now. The Babylonian Syro-Mesopotamian tradition enlisted the equivalent of today's show business to project biblical stories, and I think of my son's statement that Disney movies have taught him more about the Bible than the catechism, which is, uh, I think, uh, very significant. The artsy character of these spiritual promoters readily exposed them to accusations of immorality by the church fathers, associ associating them with the faults and weaknesses of non-religious practitioners, and this vulnerability often allowed them to keep closer to a genuine concern for the poor and the sinners. Nahitas often comments on Simeon's level of education. The polemic reflects this long-standing opposition between high and low culture, revealing different approaches to evangelization with increasingly polarized outcomes. Simeon preferred popular celebration and performance over written culture. Only Nikitas's editorial efforts consigned to us a much more literary persona than I think was the case. But we should read that life more closely for signs of orality. Simeon does not read scripture, he prosomilain with it. Our translations water down the power of the Greek text and its multiple implications. Every time scriptures and written culture are mentioned in the Vita, Nahitas counterbalances them with a verb of speech. I would argue then that a concern with the spoken word as a primary focus of evangelization, as well as an emphasis on visual experience, as if in a staged show, characterized Simeon's choices, abilities, and extraction. The method of geo-ecclesiology developed by Philippe Blodeau for the study of Alexander controversies of the 5th and 6th centuries employs spatial concepts such as foreland, hinterland, center, periphery to relativize controversial issues according to geographical coordinates. These tools help us describe controversies by looking for an international structure not of power but of meaning and social value. Blodeau adds an important reminder that divisions were never welcome in a church intended to be the body of Christ. Paul's image seals the early church obsession with unity. A body only makes sense as one whole, while at the same time this metaphor impresses productive diversity as a necessary fact and not just as an ideal. How far diversification is institutionally allowed will depend on the period, place and geopolitical situation. 
the proximity of Islamic beliefs and practices, coupled with military and political threats, increasingly impacted on Christianity's self-definition, particularly in Asia Minor, but with evident repercussions in Constantinople, partly in order to set Christianity on an equal footing with powerful Muslim intellectuals, such as Avicenna, Efforts at raising standards encroached even on the sphere of popular manifestations of piety, such as the cult of saints, restricting its folkloric manifestations and erasing the vernacular, recitative character of their narratives. Simeon may have been a victim to these stricter measures that promoted standards of quality assurance through a written high culture. What role did the Studites take in this realignment? I submit that their handling of Simeon's memory was part of a concerted effort at keeping unity in the face of all too rapid changes. The ancient monastic foundation of Studios was itself divided between the Syrian tradition of the sleepless monks and Theodore's Benedictine-style reforms that ensured work, particularly scribal work, to balance perpetual prayer, manifesting two sides that may have remained hidden under one denomination. The life of Alexander the Sleepless takes us right to the banks of the Euphrates, but Nikitas is careful to let us know that Simeon did manual work in the form of manuscript copying. Now, to understand this situation, I have this example of these two 20th century Dominican houses in Salamanca, Spain, of which one was an ultra-liberal uh, house that honored the memory of Bartolomé de las Casas, and so was sort of um, very liberal, and the other was an ultra-conservative Tridentine house, and the friars hardly spoke to each other. So they are called Dominicans, but actually they were two different realities at that point in time, which a, a historian would find it very difficult to to, to kind of discern from, from the cover, as it were. And I think in the same way, we need to unravel these two faces of studios, which is a difficult task, but an important one for our subject. So geo-ecclesiology allows us to frame this opposition outside the normal dogmatic approaches of orthodox versus heterodox discourse, which is familiar to theologians, using spatial concepts that trace networks of influence and communication. It allows us to map Simeon's life to hot spots of controversy, the capital, Nicomedia, the Pontus, the eastern frontier, and areas or orbits of actions, for example, the role of the Bosphorus as a kind of theological buffer zone. A territorial mapping of Simeon's life is beyond what I can do today, but it would obviate the problems of bias and apologetics inherent in Nikitas's work. Moreover, by reconstructing propaganda networks through sources over time, oh, other than written, so with speeches, slogans, nicknames, and images, this methodology, geoecclesiology, expands the horizon in ways that are useful, I think, especially to our research on Simeon. So with this methodological underpinning, I analyze now two phrases. One is the most humble God, and the other one is the men of passion. And my purpose is to follow these leads, of course I've used the TLG, and see where they take us in shaping an international structure of meaning and social value. And I argue that they confirm my proposed identity for Simeon as heir to a Syrian performative tradition. So Basil Krivoshin dedicated an article at a time when Simeon's writings were hardly known to analyze the implications of this rare designation of God as the not proud one in the work of Simeon. So the adjective aniperifanos is found twice in Simeon's work. In, a passage, uh, in the first passage from the Thanksgiving, Simeon describes the hiddenness of God as his humbleness while using the biblical language of divine revelation to Moses at the burning bush to describe the essence of divinity as supreme being. I quote, I still did not know that it was thou thyself, my not proud God and Lord. I had not yet been vouchsafed to hear thy voice so that I may know thee 
and thou hast not yet mystically told me it is I, egoimi. In the second passage, uh, also the, uh, thanksgivings, the prevailing element is instead water, alluding to baptismal initiation as much as to the often used metaphor of the relief of spiritual thirst as when Moses and later Peter strike water from the rock. I quote, thereafter, while I was standing near the source, thou, the not proud one, didst not deem it unworthy of thee to descend more often, but coming near, holding first my head, thou dippest it in the waters and madest me to see clearer the light of thy face. Here the physical involvement of Simeon in the experience of revelation is wrapped more loosely with biblical allusion and transforms even the sacramental action into a more intense, original and personal encounter. This exaggerated intensity closely recalls the style of apocryphal narratives where a perceivable ecclesiastical experience is nevertheless magnified and somewhat distorted by what are for us unfamiliar elements. Krivoshain identified the phrase on Epiphenos Theos in two apocryphal texts. The first is a prayer enumerating God's attributes as a kind of litany in the Acts of John, which was a popular text banned by the Council of Nicaea II in 787 for containing a passage where the Apostle John fails to endorse the making and veneration of his portrait by his disciple. And you see here the parallel with Simeon's own attempts at portraying Simeon Eulavis. So the prayer where the expression occurs belongs to the conclusion of the Acts, describing John's death and ascension, a section preserved separately from the rest of the text and read in the church on the saint's day. The prayer is spoken by John as his last words to his disciples, and it concludes by invoking a divine manifestation and a protection. Succor thy servants by your visitation, Episcopi. James's translation of the adjective in question as despiser of none reveals his unfamiliarity with the term and a reluctance to attribute humility as a quality of God, despite, of course, this being tied to the incarnation in the discourse, God's humility may be seen in opposition to his being the seer of all, who art in all and everywhere present, containing all things and filling all things, which is the conclusion of this prayer. The second apocryphal text, where the adjective defines the Godhead, is a third century romanced narrative known as the Acts of Santipe, Polixena, and Rebecca, the phrase occurs here within the speech of the protagonist, Xantippe, a matron living in Spain, who hears of the Apostle Paul through her servant who had returned from home, from Rome, sorry, and longs to meet him. The context is one of internal inspiration and prophetic revelation. Xantippe's dilemma, whether or not to speak, is dramatized as follows. I desire to keep silence and I'm compelled to speak for someone inflames and sweetens me within. I will sh if I say I will shut my mouth, there is someone that murmurs in me. Shall I say a great thing? It is not that teacher that is in Paul without arrogance, filling the heavens, speaking within and waiting without, sitting on the throne with the Father and stretched upon the cross by man. What therefore I shall do, I do not know. Paul's internal voice, his teacher, is the not proud God within, who is at the same time filling the heavens, similarly to what was in John's prayer. The sense that God is everywhere, yet small, that the smallness and humility of God amounts to his greatness, plays on the complexity of significances characteristic of Christian paradox, where definitions are made elastic and dialectic by being always complicated by their opposites. God is great, but not proud at the same time. This leaves space for his humble manifestations in creation, subtracting ownership of God from the powerful and the mighty. A new TLG search added two sources to Krivoshen's list, and they're from the seventh century, and I can't really, don't really have time to go into them. But they are both works steeped in the background of the Persian conquests, and they emphasize an oral presentation of the faith, 
designed for a wider public. So perhaps uh, this, this uh, discovery by Krivoshen was set aside because of the apocryphal nature of these acts. Uh, but in fact, they're being included in Basil's uh, the Seconds Menologion. You can see here that a page of the commemoration of these women uh, is uh, is actually uh, a proof that they were they were current at the time. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, illustration. And as you see, the third woman, Rebecca, has been eliminated from uh, from this uh, commemoration. And that's an interesting question. But I also have to set that aside. It is a tantalizing hypothesis that the Codex Unicos of the full text of the Acts of Santippe, Polixena, and Rebecca, uh, which is at this 10th or early 11th century manuscript, could be, could maybe have been held or produced at some manas. Um, so it, its contents reveals a constellation of saints that point towards Syria. So there are two stylite saints' life, Daniel of Annapolis, and we know that Annapolis is also mentioned in, in Simeon's life, and look the stylite. There is also the life of Ambrose of Milan with the passion of the saints of the relics he discovered, Gervasius and Protasius, and, um, and also Ambrose had links with Syria. And there is also John Chrysostom's sermon against the theaters, which uh, is also an interesting text in this connection. Uh, the coherent of such collection is maybe for us difficult to see but I think we need to work more on identifying strands within Christianity that can make sense of particular combinations of texts and saints, such as this one. So I return to the connection between Simeon and these acts, and they, one should note that they have attracted recent attention on the part of gender scholars who have read instances of more or less veiled homoeroticism in these texts, and I won't enter into the merits of this analysis, but there's clearly a lot of parallels, and I think you've, you've already uh, seen this yourself with a quote that I made. But uh, in particular, this article by Virginia Boris perceptibly reads the intricate narrative of the acts of these three women as showing, as showing that in it, and I quote, desire is not merely oriented towards a transcendent object, as represented most resplendently by Xantippe's visions of Christ as a beautiful youth having around him trembling rays and under him an extended light on which he walked, desire is also powerfully triangulated through human loves. And so the visionary experience of light is coupled with close human contacts where spiritual intensity becomes incarnate. So Simeon's combination of mystical revelation and close ties to his spiritual father match this dual component of religious experience. Strong emotions and deep expressions of human sentiments are part of his approach to divine experience. They need not be set aside. Although the acts do not have a perfect equivalent to the expression men of desire that we are about to explore, Burrus's desiring women nails this concept perfectly. So we turn to the expression desiring men, Andras Epithymion, um, which describes uh, the disciples of Simeon as he moves uh, to some mamas, and this is chapter 34 of the Vita. In this highly elusive and frankly strange passage, Nikitas plays on the image of the fruitful vineyard as well as with notions of life and death. Greenfield notes, sorry, Greenfield notes that this expression occurs in some verses of Daniel, in the version by Theodosian, and you see Theodosian here from a manuscript uh, being uh, displayed inside Sinope, where he was meant to have worked. So Daniel, the prophet uh, Daniel is, is expressed, is addressed as a man of desires, um, without qualification, first by Gabriel, and then by the two human-shaped beings who encourage him and speak with him. And this speech is very important, I think. Gabriel is entrusting Daniel with the rebuilding of Jerusalem, a background that is well suited to the takeover of the ruined Samamas church by Simeon. In a positive sense, the expression is also found without qualification in Theodos Tudait's great catechesis, 
where men of desire are marked out against a generation of adulterers and sinners. But may he protect you more and more as his strong soldiers, as his faithful servants, as men of passion, as his chosen people, as the most holy assembly, Episubnama here is an apax, so that in this generation one can truly say of adulterers and sinners, you will be found zealous for piety. And it's repeated again in, a, in an epistle by Theodore addressed to a community at Chisicus headed by another Simeon, which may be a coincidence that might be just plucked to this expression, but maybe that can be explored more if we knew more about this uh, monastery. Nikitas's repeated use of Andra Sepitumion at chapter 58 of the life, referring to a list of Simeon's special disciples mentioned by name, Antony, Ianikios, Soterikos, Basil, and Simeon, makes it look programmatic for our understanding of Simeon the new theologian and his circle. Of course, we can neutralize the understanding of these expressions, the not proud God, the man of desire, so those who desire spiritual things, and make them fit within an uncontroversial, plain, homogeneous overview of Christianity. However, this neutralizing operation, on which Nikitas himself counted for success in effecting his hero's acceptance, is undermined by the controversial story of Simeon's life. It is more likely that these two expressions map out an area of belonging as, and signal a current of Simeon's Christian practice, that held particular significance. The Acts of Santippe and Companions point to environments such as 3rd century Syria, where such stories were forged. Their focus on visionary Paul is also found in Simeon's Vita. The Men of Desire took a particular understanding of the Christian experience that we can associate with charismatic movements, but should also understand in a deeper historical perspective as deriving from very ancient traditions. I suggest that we should read the life to discover more concrete proofs of this belonging, taking more literally and concretely some of the language pointed to use by Nikitas. As abbot of San Mama Xilokerko, Simeon was associated with the literature of San Mamas' monastery. Xilokerko did not simply indicate Constantinople's city gate, but the name also alluded to the wooden circus arena placed near the church of San Mamas outside the city walls, possibly since Constantine's times. Considered in this light, the constant metaphors of monastic life as entering the arena would then not be merely metaphorical. They could also allude to a context of performance and celebration of paralyzed liturgical, though often biblical, narratives and saints or martyrs feasts whose explicit mention would have compromised Simeon's reputation further because they came to be thought of as inappropriate by contemporaries. Here, I suggest, lies the problem with Simeon's behavior. At chapter 44, Nikita summarizes the character of Simeon's life and that of his community of some mamas as follows. This was the sort of life he, he led, to put it briefly practical, very contemplative, profoundly spiritual, and accomplished in the study of theology and the great wisdom of God. And this was also the sort of flock he had, one that was, as it were, another church of the holy studites in his rules, activities, even in its very dress and customs, although one might rather say it was a church of incorporeal angels singing psalms intelligibly to God and ministering fervently to him. The Greek is more complex than this trans trans translation makes out. First, or empractos theoritikotatos tekie ipsilotatos cannot easily be translated in three separate components where the visuality of theoria is underplayed. Second, the text does not say that Simeon was accomplished in the study of theology, but rather that he found perfection in the word of theology and logo theologias. Nikitas chose his words carefully. In his exile at San Mamas, Simeon constructs an alternative studios, his monks mirroring on earth, uh, on earth the angelic choirs of the divine liturgy in heaven. This Dionysian allusion 
underscores the performative activities at Samamas, including the different costumes and practices, and should be considered when discussing the consonants between Simeon and the pseudo Dionysus. Um, sorry, I have suggested that Simeon's religious practices continued and possibly renewed the Syrian tradition of sleepless monks in parallel to other student monastery to the other student monastery, and that Simeon himself fostered an oral tradition of scriptural interpretation akin to Midrash and containing a dramatic performative element that received growing condemnation and marginalization by the intellectual circles of an increasingly repressive Constantinopolitan hierarchy. Once more, it was the Studites who struggled against a new wave of iconoclasts. Nikitas' huge editorial enterprise consigned a better memory of Simeon to posterity as part of his efforts of healing and uniting a divided church, which included perhaps his own monastery. And thank you for your attention. Thank you as well for this very interesting and rich paper, speech, that uh, gives a lot of food for thought for the discussion to follow. Now, according to our agenda, the next uh, speaker is Father Sabino Calla, prior of the monastic community of Bose in Italy, the new prior as he was um, elected in January, and he will answer the question, had the Simeon, the new theologian, already sacked the Syrian? I believe this is a crucial question. And it is very interesting that this speech follows Ms. Crostini, because on the one hand, the topic of Syria is still present in this speech, and also Ms. Crostini, in her speech, showed us the, um, the, the cover of the edition published by the community, the monastic community of Bose many years ago. And our academy is very happy and honored by the presence of Father Sabino Kala because we have long standing relationship with the community of Bose. Uh, I know that you had a lot of prior commitments that you set aside in order to be here with us, so we welcome you and we are looking forward to hear to your speech, to listen to your speech. I would like to thank you as well for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me in this conference. It is an opportunity to meet again with many friends. This is why I would like uh, to participate. This is why I said yes. But also because I'm very much interested in this topic. The title of my speech. Did Simeon the New Theologian read Isaac the Syrian? In his treatise on Essekas and the two modes of prayer, Gregory Palamas exhorts the Essekast monk thus, I quote, Always read works on Essekasm and prayer, such as Climacus, St. Isaac, St. Maximus, St. Nilus, Ezekius, Philotheos of Sinai, the new theologian, his disciples Thetathos, and others like them, end of quote. The leader of the Essekast movement thus gives an interesting list in that particular moment of monastic renewal of the works that he considers authoritative for those who intend to live in Essekia. Among this, he mentions the two authors that I will deal with in this paper as I try to answer the question posed in the title, that is, whether Simon, the new theologian, to whom is dedicated our conference, had occasion to read the writings of Isaac of Nineveh, or Isaac the Syrian, as is better known in the Greek word. First point of my presentation, Isaac in Greek word. 
As I know, I, as is known, Isaac lived at the turn of the 7th, 8th centuries. He was a Syro Oriental monk and bishop of the Episcopal See of Nineveh, although only for a few months. Among the fathers that Gregory Palamas mentions, he is the only one who did not write in Greek and who, moreover, belongs to the Syria, Syro Oriental Church, which in his time was already for several centuries not in communion with the other churches. In spite of this, the most important part of his writings, the one that goes by the name of the first collection, was quickly translated, more or less integrally, into all the languages spoken by Christians, first of all into Greek, while the second and third collection appear not to have been translated into Greek in ancient times. The translation of the first collection was carried out between the end to the eighth and mid ninth century by Abraham and Patricius, two monks of the Lavra of St. Sabbath in Palestine. This is an exceptional fact, because usually the translation of patristic text that we know occur in the opposite direction, from Greek into other languages. Isaac, on the contrary, is a Syrian translated into Greek. The only other Syrians who were treated similarly are Ephraim and a very small part of the writings of John of Daliata and Philoxenus of Mabuk, some of whose works ended by among those of Isaac. Even the Latin fathers translated into Greek in antiquity were very few. Gregory the Great, the Alogos, John Cassian and Benedictine's rule. Isaac thus remain an exceptional case. The Greek version of Isaac's first collection became widely diffused very quickly as the large number of manuscripts, the oldest already from the 9th centuries, that have survived to our times testify. A close analysis of this manuscript tradition is found in the excellent critical edition of Marcel Pirard. This fact is already a clear indication of the chronological diffusion of Isaac's works. Byzantine writers of the 11th to 15th centuries confirm the evidence of the codices. Isaac, in fact, is constantly drawn upon and quoted and is included in Florilegia, Paterica, among the authoritative fathers, especially for his ascetic and monastic te teachings. The most ancient examples of this diffusion in chronological order are Paul Evergetinos, who in his synagogue mentions Isaac about 50 times, thus making him one of the most quoted authors. Nikon of the Black Mountain, who quotes Isaac in his voluminous Florilegium with the title Interpretation of the Lord's Commandments, Pandecte. And John Oxet, Patriarch of Antioch, who quotes him in his ascetic eclogues, together with other fathers. The scholia to the ladder of John Climacus make reference to Isaac in the same way, citing him very often and explicitly. The probable compilator, or one of the compilators of his work, Elias of Crete, lived in the 11th, 12th century. Especially significant is also the present, presence of explicit quotations from Isaac in works by author of these centuries beginning with Peter of Damascus in his works that were included in the Philokalia, who quotes Isaac 30 times. 
This presence of quotes from Isaac intensifies as we come closer to the 14th century. We have in mind authors such as Nicephorus the Atonite, Gregory of Sinai, Gregory Palamas, and the brothers Xanthopoli, who in their work Method and Exact Canon cite Isaac 86 times. The picture that emerges from this brief enumeration justifies us the opinion that the Greek translation of Isaac contributed significantly to the revival of Byzantine spirituality, spiritual literature that we see from the 10th century on, and at a moment of particular glory in the 14th century. Something similar will occur again in the 20th century, when Isaac will contribute considerably to the renewal of monastic life on Mount Athos. One example is the attention that Joseph the Esikast died in 1959, gives to Isaac's works. His disciple and biographer, Joseph of Vatopedi says, I quote, our elder nourished a particular fondness for the writings of St. Isaac the Syrian. They were practically his handbook. He used to quote entire chapters by heart, end of quote. The same is told about Ephraim of Katunakia, whose biographer states, I quote, we used to see him reading by the light of a small lantern, even for a short time, usually for about an hour, his favorite ascetic works, especially St. Isaac the Syrian. He used the edition of Spezieris from 1995. Because he read this often, the pages had become loose and he had repasted them with adhesive tape. On the opening pages, he had written many quotes, first in pencil, then in pen. He especially loved Discourse 81, end of quote. Other examples are Emilianos of Simonopetra, as shown by the numerous quotes of Isaac in his works, and Vasilios of Stavronikita, and subsequently of Iviron, the author of an article published first in Greek in 1981, and promoter of the critical edition of the Greek Isaac realized by Marcel Pirat. My second point, Simeon the New Theologian as reader of the Fathers. After showing briefly the context in which Isaac stands in the Greek Byzantine world, we can return to our question. Was the New Theologian one of those who knew and appreciate Isaac's works? Chronologically, this would have been possible since, in his times, Isaac had already been translated into Greek and was appreciated even in Constantinople, as shown by the example of Paul Evergetinos, a quasi-contemporary of Simeon. Simeon and Paul are two very different personalities, as even their works demonstrate but have certain bi biographical traits in common. Among them, they stay of lesser or greater duration at studios, although both, in different ways, distance themselves from its monastic model. These two personalities differ also for something important for the theme that interests us here, that is, the reference to the preceding, preceding tradition. While Paul declares explicitly that he follows the fathers, whom he had read probably in the rich library of studios, and whom he cites abundantly in his works, Simon, as has been noted, cites very few fathers. In fact, he shows in this a new attitude, dominated by the recounting of his personal experience, which he prefers to the explicit repetition of the words of the Holy Fathers. Here, we have a trait of 
Simon's peculiar genius, who, as Basilio Petra says, commenting on Stelios Ramphos, insists on, I quote, fate as personal experience, as experience of a direct and warm relation between God and man in the spirit, as an interior perception of the divine light, which clashes on the one end with the illuminism of the humanists in Byzantium, and on the other with the supporters of purely ecclesiastical faith." End of quote. In this lies the modernity of Simeon and his approach to God and to the spiritual experience, in which value is set on the individual as an active subject who stands before God in his unrepeatable, unrepeatable particularity. This, however, does not mean that the new theologian is less traditional in the contents of his writings than Paul ever get in us. He is in the form he gives them, preferring a more personal and experiential narrative in which the fabric of patristic reminiscences is underground, hence more difficult to trace, yet remains clear. He is thus new in form rather than in content. He prefers the first person singular, which is rare in ascetic literature, to underline the primacy of his personal experience, but this does not mean that he ignores or undervalues the experience of those who preceded him. Barbara Crostini Lappin observes in this regard, I quote, this does not mean, on the other hand, that Paul lacks originality or that Simon is cut off from tradition. Both derived from the experience and the thought of the fathers, and both depart from it by interpreting, manipulating, and thus recreating an understanding of the tradition itself. While, however, Paul submits to carrying out his role through the method of florilegia as guarantee of authority, in conformity to the characteristically met medi medieval method of approaching theological debate, Simon dared to make his own voice heard in the first person." End of quote. Tradition thus for the new theologian is the ground in which his own thinking grows, but his specific method makes it more difficult to point out its traces. In fact, he cites few fathers explicitly or, or whom he shows clearly as known to him. Among these are Gregory the Theologian, Basil, John Chrysostom, and John Climacus, and in a lesser measure also Maximum the Confessor. Third point, traces of Isaac in Simon's works. Simon never mentions Isaac by name, nor do there seem to be literally borrowings from one of his discourses. This, however, does not exclude the possibility that Simon had had the opportunity to read a work that had been translated shortly before his time and that had only recently reached the capital. As one so susceptible to the new, he probably appreciated a text that was not yet a venerable work of the fathers and his time, but a new publication. This is the opinion of the great scholar of the new theologian and the editor of his works, Basil Krivoshene, who states, I quote, it must be noted that 
In the same period, 10th century, the ascetic works of the great Syriac mystic Isaac of Nineveh were translated from the original Syriac into Greek. They spread quickly in the Byzantine world, arousing a lively, lively interest and contributed greatly to the renewal of mysticism. It is probable that Simon knew these writings even if he never speaks of them. Irene Serre and Völker, who were among the first modern readers of the works of the new theologian, have also discerned some traces of Isaac in Simon's work, as well as, particularly interesting to note, also in his disciple and biographer, Nikita Stethatos. The work of detecting them, however, is only beginning. Due to Simon's particular creative expressive form, to which I have alluded, to have more convincing results and attentive meticulous and meticulous analysis to his work individually will be needed. Here, I limit myself to give only a few preliminary results, snippets of themes and assonances from the catechesis and centuries that seems to recall Isaac. The catechesis are the first in date, at least in their oral formulation, from the beginning of Simon's literary activity, that is, from the time he was Igumen and Semamas, even if they were then edited later. The centuries, on the other hand, appear to be among his latest works. Latest works, According to Fregno Julien, I quote, they should be placed towards the end of Simon's life. From the first corpus, the catechesis, I've noted the following common themes. First, love seen as the distinctive signs of disciples and especially the love that nurtures the heroic and otherwise inexplicable action of the apostles and martyrs. Catechesis 1, Isaac 33, 5. In this case, the parallel regards not only the contents, contest, the contents, sorry, but also the form of the text. This is interesting. Second point, the importance of terse a frequently recurring theme both in Simon and in Isaac. Catechesis 2, 4, 5, 9, 19, 29, and Isaac very in a few passages, in a lot of passages. Third, humility as the seal of the Holy Spirit. Catechesis 2, Isaac 8, 12. Four, Attentiveness to small faults, so as not to fall into the great ones. Catechesis 5 and Passim, Isaac 37 and Passim. 5. The importance of feeling the presence of God and of the spiritual senses. We have a lot of passages in uh, uh, Simon and in Isaac that insist on this point. As can be noted, these are all themes of particular importance. They are by no means exclusive of our two authors, but it seems to me to be of interest how much importance both of them give to the subjects. Also in the centuries, which differ from the catechesis by their brevity, I believe to have found the presence of several themes that are developed likewise in similar terms in Isaac's works as such. First, the passage from fear to love as a necessary maturing of a, person's, of a person's relation with the Lord, where fear is seen as the necessary prerequisite for a fullness that is reached only in love of God. Centuries 1, Isaac 43. Second, the affirmation that in order to be united with God, 
It is first necessary to become separated from the world, expressed in terms similar to those of Isaac, centuries 1, Isaac 4. Third point, the idea that in order to distance oneself from the world, it is necessary to possess love of God and the remembrance of him, centuries 1, Isaac 45. Four, the assertion that there are times during prayer when tears flow without any effort on the part of him who prays, centuries 1, Isaac 6, 35, and 70, 79. Five, the clarification that not every attitude that seems to be due to humility is so in reality and that the true humility is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Centuries 191, Isaac 82. Last point, six, the theme that the naked intellect, which derives from Evagrius, certainly, is also taken by Isaac. Centuries 2, Isaac 3. As I said at the beginning, the similarities that I've pointed out are only indications before a more ample and systematic research, which, and this is a significant result of my excursus, I think, merits to be carried out. Both in the catechesis and in the centuries, I see important elements of convergence None of them is sufficiently convincing to affirm with certitude that Simon had read Isaac, yet they are not negligible. It also seems to me interesting to point out the high concentration of this coincidence in a small text such as that of the centuries, which, as I've said, belong to the last phase of the literary activity of the new theologian. Simon then had read Isaac? It is very probable. Also because a new man such as him would have hardly allowed himself to ignore this publishing novelty in the capital and which had known a success rather unique than rare in the Byzantine world. Thank you for your attention. Και εμείς ευχαριστούμε για αυτήν την τόσο διαφωτιστική. Thank you for this highly enlightening and interesting presentation that taught us a lot. And now, with no further ado, if the technical means are in place, we will proceed to the third and last lecture for today, delivered by Miss Courtney Tomazelli. She's an instructor at the Loyola University of Chicago, entitled. To such men, authority to bind and loose is given by God. Saint Simeon, the New Theologian, on confession in the Psalter, in the Psalter Codex, Vaticanus Gregus, 1927. Miss Tomazelli, you have the floor for 15 minutes, as it is included on the agenda. Δεν ακούμε, υπάρχει πρόβλημα λίγο στον ήχο. Did we can't hear you. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Let me... Okay. I would like to extend my deepest thanks to the Volos Academy for Theological Studies for hosting this wonderful conference on Simeon the New Theologian, whose theology has become so integral to my work. I, I would also like to thank the uh, Sorry, excuse me, excuse me to interrupt you. Please try to Nikos read Romanos a little bit particular. more slowly. Yes. Because we have uh, uh, interpretation, I, I simultaneous translation. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, 
So I would like to thank the organizers and Dr. Nikos Coromenos in particular for being so flexible and making sure that I could still give my paper despite being unable to travel to Greece at the last minute. I am very grateful that I am still able to share a little bit of my work and I wish that I could be there in person. A viewer contemplating Psalm 31 is confronted by a group of seemingly disparate vignettes in the prefatory image to this psalm in the illustrated Psalter, Vaticanus Graecus, 1927. A lone man stands at the juncture of two mountainous masses, arms pointed to the left side of the painting in supplication. Behind him on the right, a group of men, several with distinctive headdresses indicating their status as Jewish elders, also lift their arms in prayer. Beneath them, two black demons torment a bound, nude figure. Moving to the upper left side of the painting, one encounters the object of veneration, a pen and ink bust of Christ floating under a baldachin his body drawn so that the gleaming gold of the leaf that comprises the sky shines through. The baldachin's cover is painted blue with striations that suggest marble, while the thin Corinthian columns supporting it are also drawn in pen and ink so that the gilt background comprises their materiality. Beneath Christ and the baldachin are three young men facing a monk, their hands raised in his direction. This monk is elderly, with a long white beard and walking stick. His kukulian, his headdress, distinguishes him as being of high rank in this manuscript. He is likely, but does not necessarily have to be, a hegumenos. A blue inscription next to each figure or group provides clues as to how these different vignettes should be interpreted and can be fit together as a cohesive whole in this rather strange image. In the lower margin beneath the young men, an inscription taken from verse 5 of the psalm provides the key to understanding the image's entire didactic message. In quotes, I said, I will confess mine iniquity to the Lord against myself, end quote. Fully unpacking this image reveals that it promotes and supports the ability of certain monks, particularly spiritual fathers, to hear confession and grant absolution through their inheritance of charismatic apostolic authority as advocated by both Simeon the New Theologian and the writer of his Vios and compiler of his writings, Nikita Stethetos, for whom my dissertation made a circumstantial case as patron of the manuscript. This is a particularly apt subject for a psalm whose first verse is, Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Before unpacking this image, a little more about the nature of Vaticanus Graecus 1927. It is a late 11th century Psalter with at least one large prefatory image on a lavish golden background planned for each psalm and ode. These complex narrative images create an illustrative paratext similar to Catena, literary paratexts used as commentary on books of the Bible. The images were likely composed specifically for this Psalter. Fully parsing each image requires a deep knowledge of patristic and contemporary theology. In particular, the patristic commentaries of the Psalms of John Chrysostom and Theodoret, contemporary commentaries exemplified by that of Euthemius Sigebenus, liturgical texts, monastic advice literature, such as The Ladder of Divine Ascent by John Climacus, and the writings of Simeon the New Theologian. The Psalter's narrative images often situate monks as the ozii, the holy ones of Psalms, and were constructed to teach monastic values and the charismatic path to salvation and union with God theosis espoused by Simeon the New Theologian. Small, detailed, and complex, the manuscript's didactic and moralizing compositions are designed for very careful looking. King David guides the viewer through its lessons as a monastic spiritual father, which is unique in extant Byzantine art. His transformation within the folios deliberately recapitulates the seminal moments in the life of St. Anthony of Egypt, the prototypical monastic spiritual father. 
Here and in many other images, David prays in the wilderness. He is also attacked by demons, recalling the battles of St. Anthony, victorious through prayer. Spiritual fatherhood was the practice of mentoring a new or less spiritually secure individual in the monastic life. It became more common in 11th and 12th century Byzantium for lay people to rely on the guidance of spiritual fathers, such as Simeon the New Theologian. The prefatory illustration to Psalm 31 is one of many that reference Simeon the New Theologian's writings. Each figural group is demarcated by an inscription that references a particular verse to the psalm. These are found on all the manuscripts' images, and the inscriptions usually, but aren't always, truncated psalm verses. Near the center of the illustration, the man who raises his hands towards the baldachin is identified as the blessed man, in quotes, to whom the Lord will not impute sin, end quote, of verse 2. The group of men to the upper right are associated with an inscription taken from verse 11, in quotes, be glad in the Lord and exult, righteous ones." End quote. Completing the inverted triangle of this composition um, is the nude, bleeding man. This part of the image is particularly abraded, and like other demons in the manuscript, the two that torment him have been scratched out almost entirely on purpose. Part of the verse 10 captures this unfortunate soul, in quotes. Many are the scourges or plagues of the sinner." End quote. The inscriptions are truncated verses intended to trigger the memory of the rest of the verse, which is where fuller didactic meaning might be found. For example, the sinner is associated with many are the scourges of the sinner. Well, the second clause of that verse provides an unwritten moralizing lesson for the viewer to remember, in quotes, but to him that hopes in the Lord, mercy shall compass about. Visually, the inverted triangular composition leads the viewer's eyes to the two exemplars of righteousness above in contrast. Naked figures are used repeatedly through Vaticanus Gricus 1927 to indicate that the person is a soul. This portion of the image seems to illustrate both life and afterlife for the unfortunate sinner. The demons plaguing him through life and leading him to sin will continue to haunt him in death by tormenting his soul in very corporeal ways. The two groups above him impart to the viewer a lesson that both baptism and confession are necessary to achieve redemption and salvation. More on that shortly as we turn to the central figure of the image. He is the blessed man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, completing that verse is the clause, in quotes, and in whose mouth there is no guile, end quote. He faces and supplicates Christ along a horizontal axis. While aligning along a diagonal with the young men who confess to the Hegumenos. Once again, the caption sparks the memory of the complete verse and the lesson at hand confess fully and honestly when the time comes. But complete understanding can only be achieved through the knowledge of outside sources. Both Theodoret and Zygubenus take verses 1 and 2 as a reference to baptism. Of the specific inscription given above the central man, Zygubenus writes, in quotes, to whom he will not attribute, he will not account, on account of its having been removed by the bath of regeneration. End quote. Taking a typological approach, Theodoret states that David was looking to, in quotes, grace of the New Testament and to the forgiveness accorded the believers through all holy baptism. He declares them blessed for actually receiving forgiveness of sins effortlessly. End quote. Here we have a triangular composition that shows two paths to the forgiveness of sins, baptism and confession. Each is sanctified by Christ, who does not appear in an icon or in physical theophany on earth, which is very common in this manuscript, but is drawn in pen and ink outline with the translucent gilded background visible through him. 
This technique is used in the manuscript to show a visionary experience of the divine, with the outline allowing for radiant, seemingly divine light to stream forth, similar to that written about and experienced by Simeon the New Theologian. God is fully present in this image of Christ, and one who experiences him in this way experiences not just an image of Christ, but the unmediated light of the divine. As such, both baptism and confession are set out as divinely blessed remediators of sin. Turning to the left side of the illustration, Christ in the Baldachin appears immediately above the scene of confession to the Hugumenos, as if it were taking place in front of the iconostasis of a church. Here there are two lessons. One comes from the psalm itself. Verse 5 states, in quotes, I acknowledged my sin and hid not my iniquity. I said, I will confess my iniquity to the Lord against myself, and you forgave the ungodliness of my heart, end quote. A reminder not to hide away any sins, but to confess them. Zygabenus reminds us that David had declared murder and adultery capital crimes, but that he was spared death by God's forgiveness due to his fervent and heartfelt confession. That a monk could mediate both the confession and absolution of sin is the second more subtle lesson. The composition strongly suggests that this is not simply the practice of legismi, the disclosure of thoughts to a spiritual father. The entire illustration seems to imply that this action is blessed by God and allows the subject to be absolved of sin. The authority of unordained monks to bind and loose was an increasingly contentious topic in the 11th century. Niketa Stethetos continued to promote the teachings of Simeon the New Theologian on the subject. In his first epistle, Simeon the New Theologian addressed the subject of confession, including the question of who has the authority to bind and loose as regards sin. According to him, in quotes, before there were monks, bishops alone used to receive the authority to bind and loose by right of succession as coming from the divine apostles. But with the passing of time and with the bishops becoming good for nothing, this awe-inspiring function was extended to priests of blameless life and accounted worthy of divine grace. And when these also were infected with disorder, priests and bishops together becoming like the rest of the people, and many of them, as is also the case now, falling foul of spirits of deceit and idle chatter, and perishing and perishing, then this function was transferred, as I said, to the elect people of Christ, I mean, the monks. It was not withdrawn from the priests or bishops, but they deprived themselves of it." End quote. He elaborated on this transfer of authority in a later passage recounting the so-called history of its acquisition by monks. In quotes, but when only the clothing and vesture of the priesthood was left amongst men, the gift of the Holy Spirit passed to monks and was disclosed by miraculous signs, because through what they did, they were following the apostles' mode of life. End quote. Simply being a monk was insufficient to receive the ability to bind and loose from God, while priests might hold such authority. He clarified that it was entirely based on one's holiness, and more importantly, on having experienced God within a spiritual divine light. I paraphrase the following from a much longer quote. And finding their souls, they have found them in a light which is spiritual, and in this light they have seen the light unapproachable. God himself, according to that which stands written, in thy light we shall see light. This is what it means for a man to find his soul, to see God and in his light to become higher than himself, sorry, higher himself than all the visible created universe, and to have God as his shepherd and teacher. And in the power of God, he, if you like, will both know how to bind and loose. And also because he has certain knowledge of this, he will worship the giver, and he would impart the benefit of it to those needing it. I know, my child, that to such men authority to bind and loose is given by the God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, to those who are God's sons by adoption and his holy servants." End quote. Both Simeon and Nicetus Stethetos distinguish between liturgical or sacramental authority and charismatic authority. 
The former is acquired through ordination and enacted through scripts and rubrics that don't require anything in particular from the priest, uh, according to them. The latter, the charismatic authority, comes from personal experiences and holiness, from the acquisition by a spiritual father of apostolic authority that is passed on by God during his experience of unmediated divine light. Looking again at the prefatory image for Psalm 31, Simeon's emphasis on this type of charismatic authority and confession correlates with the composition on the left. The monks, I'm sorry, the men seeking penance wear plain tunics. They are not monks, but laity. Christ's pen and ink bust under the baldachin allows the golden background, the divine light, to shine through. Christ is not visual. He is visionary. To emphasize the necessity for a spiritual father to have experienced such divine light and to show that God blesses this type of confession and spiritual authority. Christ is positioned immediately above the space between the monk and those confessing. This space, however, is anything but empty. Rather, it is given over to the gestures and words of the confession and the absolution granted by the monk. The triangular composition formed is directed from the confession of the layman to the monk, whose eyes and head are subtly raised upward to Christ. Despite the damage, we can see that Christ's body and head are inclined slightly down to those confessing, indicating that he, through the intervention of the monk below, has absolved their sins. This image is but one of a number within Vaticanus Graecus 1927 that references Simeon the New Theologian's writings or life. By promoting the authority of certain monks to hear confession in this didactic manuscript, the patron, possibly Nicetus Stethotos, upheld Simeon's side of the increasingly contentious idea that the charismatic authority of holy men alone was enough to grant them the power to bind and loose. Thank you. Thank you for this very enlightening and interesting uh, speech on the very interesting topic of confession involving monks. There is a small... Uh, we have to wait for one minute in order for the video to be broadcasted. Sorry for this very small delay due to technical reasons. Once we're ready, please tell me so that we can start uh, the discussion. There are portable microphones, wireless microphones, for all of you to ask your questions. We are a bit behind schedule. <coughs> this is why I would like uh, all of you who would like to ask questions to raise your hands. I can note your names down and we can start. Are you ready? Can we start? OK, the Q&A session begins. Who would like to ask questions or make a short comment? Let me remind you that we need to speak slowly in order for our interpreters to be able to interpret. That's always the case. Everybody's hesitant at the beginning and then there is uh, not enough time for all. Um, I would like to ask a question to Father Kiala, concerning uh, Simeon's uh, no possible knowledge of Isaac's uh, writings. Um, that, that question has uh, intrigued me for years. And there is something very strange, which was already observed by uh, Bishop uh, Ilarion um, in his book on Simeon when he writes that there is a strange similarity between John uh, of Dalyata 
and Simon de New Theologian, but we will not treat this because John of Dieta is a heretic. This is what Bishop Elijah writes. And what is the strangest, according to me, is that, uh, that, that Simeon seems to know things that have not been translated into Greek. Uh, uh, th th there are similarities in the imagery. The, 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 the revelation of God first as a star in the heart of the mystic, uh, no, as a star from, 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 from afar, and then it becomes uh, a shining sun in the heart of the mystic, and other things uh, which, which are there in John of Diata and in Simon, which are not there in the translated Isaac. So how would you try to explain this? Yes, the problem is that of John of Dariata, it's impossible for uh, Simon the New Theologian to know him because it was not translated integrally. We have just few parts of John of Dariata, as you know, that were translated into Greek because they was in the uh, Syro-Western uh, 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 Syro tradition of the manuscript. Uh, in uh, the collection of the writing of St. Isaac. And when the Greek translator, Abraham and Patricius, translated Isaac from the Chalcedonian manuscripts or the Syro-Western Syro manuscript into Greek, they translated also that few parts of John of Daliata that was inside. But uh, the, the major part of the works of John of Daliata was not translated into into Greek, that it's impossible for uh, Simon to read it. That's it's very, it's very simple, the, the answer, because it's impossible for him. Maybe there are some similarities, similarities but these the subjects that they can uh, flow differently into uh, great men and great uh, spiritual men like John of Daliata, and, but the, the matter of uh, heresy is not matter for me because also Isaac is part of the same uh, tradition. If uh, John of Daliata is heretic, Isaac also is heretic. That is another question. <laughs> that means both belongs to the same church, the Syro Oriental Church, and uh, for this, uh, uh, but we know the, that means that Isaac and, uh, and John of Daliata are the same. Uh, as the same uh, Christological uh, uh, tradition. In, uh, but I, I mean, historically, uh, uh, the position is, is that. We have something uh, like that also in the Latin tradition. There is um, uh, a prayer of uh, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, which is very similar to a, a prayer that we find in uh, John of Daliata. And uh, that is because it's uh, from the small part of John of Daliat, which is inside the writings of Isaac, and was translated, was translated into Greek and then into Latin. That maybe uh, Ignatius read the Latin translation, but just because this few small part was inside the Latin translation, because it was inside the Greek translation of Isaac. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, Mr. and Mr. Delopoulos. Thank you for these three speeches. Again, a question to Father Kala. Given that San Simeon, the new theologian, must have some kind of knowledge of Isaac the Syrian, because of the large diffusion of his works. And given that Paul Evergetinos knew and quotes, makes many references to Isaac the Syrian, why is Paul Evergetinos ignoring the new theologian? Is it Is it a tendency to uh, give indication to the to the older fathers that are more righteous, or that everything needs to be standardized according to certain figures? So why 
Paul. Why Paul Evergetinos does not know or does not quote Simeon? And the second question is, let me just remind you that Father Collegian tried to seek to uh, demonstrate that San Simeon was aware of Areopagitica. What is the degree of influence uh, of um, of him to Simeon. We we could say that Areopagitica is completely different compared to the work of um, is completely different compared to what uh, San Simeon says. You mentioned the name of Bishop Alexander Kolichin. I would just like to say that he was invited to the conference. He made his best to arrive, but on the same, on the exact same dates, he will be delivered an, a honorary volume from his colleagues and uh, students, so he couldn't. Uh, be missing from that event, but he sends his warmest wishes for success to our conference. Father Sabino, the floor to you. For the first question, uh, what is different uh, in uh, between uh, the, the, in, is, it the, is the method of uh, Isaac, uh, of uh, Simeon the New Theologian and Paul Evergetinos? I think both are referring to the, the tradition, the patristic tradition, but they they use the patristic tradition in, in two different ways. As I, I quote uh, in, uh, in the text of um, uh, Barbara Christine Lappin, um, for me is important to underline this. Uh, Simon the New Theologian is paradoxiaco, is traditional, like uh, Paul Evergetinos, but his method is different. In this, uh, for this is a new man. Uh, a lot of scholars underline this character of uh, uh, Simon the New Theologian. It's new. It's new in the methodology and in in the way in which he explain, in, in which he uh, he give reference to the fathers. For him, it's not important to quote, and for us, the historian, it is more difficult to see the pièces, the sources. Because for uh, Paul Evergetinos, it's very simple, because all is clear, is there. Um, the second answer, Isaac and the uh, 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 Areopagite tradition, it's a very difficult question. Also because it's not so clear how deep is the, the influence of uh, Dionysius Areopagitis in Isaac writings, because we have just few quotations, few passages, but as you point, pointed, is uh, clear that the, the atmosphere of the writings of Isaac and the interest of Isaac are very difficult, are, are very different from the theology of uh, Areopagite. That means for Isaac what is important is the experience uh, the spiritual experience and what is important for the spiritual life of the monks in particular, but also of the people in general. It's, it's theology, I think, it's not so speculating, it's not so abstract. And for this, you know, we, we, we can see that you know the tradition of Dionysius, but it's not his first source, uh, there are, for example, the, the more Im most important uh, source for his theology are the Apophthegmata Patrum, uh, is uh, Basil and Basil, uh, Marcus the, the monk is very important in his uh, uh, tradition. Uh, and for this, I think it's also um, the, yes, the, the relationship uh, of Isaac and Simeon the New Theologian 
in front of, with the, uh, the tradition of um, Dionysius Areopagitis, is very different. For, I, I think because is, what, what is different is the interest of the, of the works of Isaac and for this, on the other end, for, of uh, Simon. Thank you, Mr. Delopoulos. Uh, Professor Crostini, you can ask your question, please. I, I just wanted to to add, if, if I may, um, about since uh, Sabino very kindly quoted my uh, article from 2003, which I reread thinking, did I really write this? Um, but uh, I, I, it's a very good question. Why does Paul ignore Simeon? But also, um, I mean, I think at the time I thought they were more more far apart than I, than I think they are now. I think uh, Paul is playing the game that that is required. He's writing. He is assembling things in order to be kind of recognized and in this writing kind of you know uh, ontology way um, he, he is taking his acts text and somehow I think I think you know Simeon belonged to this tradition but in a more fluid way and somehow you know it's it's he was in the spirit of these of these uh, Syrian monks but he, he, he didn't really, he didn't play the, the textual game. He wanted, uh, he was more more about spoken words. I think uh, I think orality is much more important in, in, in Simeon than it was in Paul. I think Paul understood he had to write. He had to make selections that would bring these two things together. That, that's, that's, um, um, and, and that is why I think uh, Courtney's, Courtney's um, images are so interesting because they are sort of speaking images. And that, that is just so, so just trying to get this, these traditions together. So they're, they're really, you know, they're losing that again. Somehow, just like in iconoclasm, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was bad to, to rely on, on images for saints' lives. So here we have Again, this this written tradition that takes over and pushes out the 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 images. So these these illuminated manuscripts really are trying to say, no, we we exist as well. We have an important thing role to play in the exegesis. Um, but this wasn't given for granted, I think, in the situation, possibly because you know the Arabs, like Germanos said at the time, you know. We are we are cutting a bad, bad we are making a bad impression on on people if we don't sort of live up to these written standards to these non non image standards and so on. So keeping this tradition was a difficult thing. Anyway, that that was sorry that my 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 I don't know how far one can go with this idea, but uh, a little bit what I'm thinking the dynamic was in, in Constantinople at the time, they were sort of near contemporary, so they, they knew this was going on very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Talk to Mr. Delopoulos and then Mr. Agarate. Thank you. A question to, to Father Sabino. All three speeches were more than interesting. So my question to Father Sabino is also a comment. You are right to focus that there are evidence on the dependence of, um, of Simeon 
own Isaac's test, texts. I have the same feeling, and I believe that we can focus on the theme of tears that you talked about. The tears, as mentioned in the theology of Saint Simeon, the new theologian, as burning tears. The texts themselves also provide an answer to Isaac the Syrian. A purely doctrinal analysis could bring into light this text. Could you please make a comment on that? I believe that it is one of the most important themes, what you talked about, the tears. For example, there is a book called Morning that talks about this theme. And also John Chrysavis has been, and a paper has been included in the uh, minutes of the Bose conference, and it is precisely about this topic. In the work of Saint Simeon, the new theologian in catechesis, there is a constant reference to tears. And Isaac the Syrian also talks very often about tears. You write about that. The floor to Mr. Algarate. Thank you. A question to Father Sabino, but it is a more general question that concerns everybody. It is about the relationship between tradition and Simeon. I'm not convinced that Simeon is following the tradition. In my opinion, and also Makakin has said that he doesn't manage to be traditional. What is the tradition of Simeon? It's him. He's, it's him, his um, father, elder Simeon the Pious, and it is about per the personal experience. How does Simeon accept the tradition? I'm very curious about that. I believe that this is a very big question. What is tradition? That's a very big problem. But my personal opinion is that Saint Simeon, the new theologian, does follow tradition. He is traditional. He does bring things from the experience of faithful, loyal people that preceded him. The problem is that this tradition is not only something that is included in his works, but it is also something that goes deeper into experience. And then through experience, using this experience, he writes. So it's not important whether he names his sources. What is more important is that the new theologian did read the texts of the fathers. This can be seen. What does it mean that a saint or a person is traditional? It means that their experience does not start from themselves. It started, it began from those that preceded him. That it is based on the faithful people that preceded him. I believe that this is helpful. I believe that Saint Simeon, the new theologian, can help us understand more warmly, more experientially what tradition is. As I said, he's a new man. And that's not my per expression. I didn't coin that term. It is a good opportunity to ask ourselves 
What does this mean? It is a saint that uh, provokes us, challenges us. Before giving the floor to Mr. Yagazoglu, I believe that everyone bases their work on previous sources or previous traditions, but the question is to what extent they remain enslaved or non-creative and to what extent they are creative. And I believe that Simeon, of course, I cannot argue that he's not traditional, I don't know his text, but I believe that he's also modern for his times. He brings in new things. The fact that he's been mocked as the new theologian is not random. This is indicative of his status and I believe that this is what is interesting about his work today because we live in a borderline times. We live in a times of transition. We know that changes happen swiftly and I believe that the Simeon, the new theologian who lived in relevant in relevant times one thousand years ago has things to share to say, has things to share with us. That's my point. Can I make a comment? Okay, so St. Basil was creative as well. The problem is that the fathers, St. John, Chrysostom, they were modern in their times. But the problem is how we read the fathers whether in their or whether we follow their spirit or whether we follow another mind are we traditional in the way we use our methods just like the fathers ensure to preserve the modernity, the modern nature of their times. Okay, Mr. Yagazoglu. I believe that Pandelis has already said everything I wanted to say. Mr. Kaleji, this comment was off the microphone, therefore cannot be translated. Mr. Yagazoglu continues, the question is whether Simeon in a new way reshapes tradition and this is something bizarre and strange this is why Simeon is one of the poor fathers not many people refer to them or make reference to them the Hesychus might say that okay that's the root of the heresies the division it's Simeon where the root of this cult lies but the point is that today we find ourselves closer to Simeon rather than to the formalistic tradition. But beware, a great tradition renewer, I'm talking about Gregory Palamas, does not include him in his rule. I dare say that he marginalizes him. Apparently, for many reasons that maybe it would be worth shedding light on them, because this is why we call him new. And the characterization new was a taunting back then. And okay, the church might say that we have three theologians that can't be called new. Okay. I believe that this is the mythical element and the way in which it is conveyed. But I believe that he's been ignored by the current and prior saints. Up to Gregory Palamas, we didn't have any such other case. And Mr. Argarate said something on which I'd like to comment the following. Let's consider his Christology his theology. Why is this not Halkidonian? Why does not follow the line of the fathers? When it comes to his spirituality, we are going to talk about that. Let's go talk about his triodology. 
Why is that? Because he's emotional, because he's poetic, he's lyrical, because he has a language that is different. All those things were strange to people back then. They remain strange today in our times. Zagoreos had cut him down because he felt that he was challenged by that. Therefore, I believe that he needs to be seen not under the formalistic perspective of tradition. This does not mean that everything is okay and that he will be vindicated. But in the tradition, there's no such relation with the spiritual father. At least I'm not aware of any such case. That's something new. And I believe that this is something that was strange and bizarre. And I believe that there is nowhere else in such obsession in including the apostles in the succession. And he's not followed by any of the other traditions. And I must say that the interpretation of this manuscript of the Psalter was wonderful because uh, this analysis approached all these uh, nuances and the modernistic aspect comes in for another reason. Simeon does not do tradition. He has an oral tradition. He ha- Maybe he's mon- marginalized, maybe he mon- has a monastic tradition, but all these things are things that can be discussed for hours and hours, and this is why we are hosting this conference. Okay, can I can I add a word on what Mr. Yagazoglu said? Yes, he is modernistic, and maybe this is rare in our orthodoxy because this is something that leads to individualism. It, he expresses feelings, emotions, his individuality. He is not lost um, amidst the community, and maybe this is what appears to be strange. I agree. But we also have other cases. We have sent a friend the Syrian, and it is in that case where we also have a lyrical discourse, a lyrical narrative, a poetic like narrative. It's another form of theology. And Saint Ephraim also is having a hard time in becoming a pillar of tradition. And it is a problem that has, uh, be, that has been relevant for years now. Maybe we can revisit this methodology. Something that is new and interesting to the modern world is the method of Saint Simeon, the new theologian, and Saint Ephraim, the Syrian. Today, we can improve the way in which we express those things using this language. A comment that is off the microphone. Okay, now it's on the microphone. A remark on what has been heard. When it comes to the meaning of the word new, okay, the word new was taunting at the beginning, but it was not the only one. And no one can say that this was the primary connotation. His disciples accepted this characterization as a title that was honoring, an honorable title. And in Constantinople, and we know that he also had uh, people, lay people among his disciples, many accepted this characterization and many made reference to the teacher as the new theologian. And uh, the new uh, manuscripts make reference to him as a new theologian, as a new, because he's a newer theologian in terms of uh, the year succession. He's a new in the meaning that he's a pioneer, that he has brought in an innovation. And having that in mind, and considering what Kreivoshin is also writing in his catechesis, that's a remark I would like to make. Thank you. If there's no other question, I would like to say something. Uh, building on what we have heard by Father Sabino. All three lectures have been very interesting. 
that, I am tempted to make a remark, and I don't want a, an answer to that. I just want to mention that Father Sabina said that that the Syro, the Isaac the Syrian is being referenced by fathers, by Orthodox fathers in the Byzantine times and even today. We have Danny, Daniel Katunakiotis, Joseph Hezekas examples, Father Basil Gondikakis, former Stavronikita, and uh, he's currently at the Monastery of Iviron. This is very typical, but the question is why? All those Orthodox people reference Isaac the Syrian and yet they refuse to accept other new saints who are not part of the canonical tradition of the Orthodoxy. So this means that we find ourselves before a puzzle. And we see that the Mount Athos fathers and altar fathers extend and expand the limits of the Orthodox Church in order to include a Syrian, an Eastern Syrian saint who is considered to be Orthodox saint. And there are a couple of exceptions, a couple of murals of St. Dominicus in Crete Island or St. Franciscus of uh, Assisi and St. Augustine prior to the scheme, the schism. But there is no other tradition. That's a paradox. That's a contradiction to the current practice followed by the Orthodox fathers. And I don't know, maybe it's, a, it's food for thought. I'm not looking for an answer here. I just wanted to share it. Paul. No worries, no worries at all. Yes, I, I, it's a profound question, and I wish the question itself was asked, in a sense, in the middle of, or later in the conference, because you would almost want to lead to the issue of Simeon and tradition once you, you, you've laid out what Simeon himself has taught on a number of subjects. And so it seems to me there's a sort of a number of hermeneutical questions that are behind the issue of whether he's traditional or not. One of them is the construal of tradition, the site of the Enlightenment, and the question of what constitutes originality and what to do about emotions, etc. So, you know, th on, on this side of Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment, on this side of sort of romantic movement, etc., we all uh, a, a sort of approach tradition with, with a very different hermeneutic, which includes uh, our own unease was the question of tradition, what tradition is. But if you think of the Orthodox tradition broadly conceived, and if you think of the tradition as the work of the Holy Spirit and the life of the Church, then, of course, you could then say that by simply pu putting ST at the very beginning of the title Simeon the New Theologian, by already sainting him, what you're doing is you're imposing a particular hermeneutic. And that's a, it's a judgment. It's a judgment that Byzantine uh, history and theology has made. And they've decided we're not going to stone him and his memory like some of his fellow monastics wanted to do, but rather we're actually going to be accepting them as, uh, him as a saint. Now, I mean, I think that once you do that, there is a danger of domesticating him and domesticating his memory. And I think he absolutely cannot be domesticated because there's something very profound and serious. I don't want to use the term radical because it's so, at least in my, it, at least in, in my ter territory of the academia, it's just so overused. But there is a sense in which when he calls to the openness of the experience of God, and he's speaking to the community of people who are very serious about Christian perfection, and they simply, the grace is simply not given. You know, I can understand how that could be an internal and significant debate. And, and, and he tells them deification is possible in this life, and they're quote-unquote trying, and again, the grace itself, it doesn't seem to be accessible in the manner in which he's calling them. So, to the extent to which the Orthodox tradition has tremendous uh, unease with the modern charismatic movement, I think St. Simeon is profoundly challenging our tradition. To the extent to which the Orthodox tradition is trying to integrate what's positive and helpful and profound about the charismatic movement, and I can think actually of the center of St. Simeon, the new theologian in Florida. I happen to be um, familiar with his, I think it's probably former um, uh, former leader, uh, Father, uh, Father Eusebius Stefanou, actually a former dean also of the Holy Cross. 
Uh, but this was, a, this was a center predicated on the notion that you can integrate charismatic tradition into the life of orthodoxy. And I think we have tremendous unease with doing so for good and bad reasons. Uh, and so, so that means essentially that he will never, that Simeon and his views and his position theologically and otherwise, if he is taken seriously and not domesticated, in a sense shouldn't be domesticated. Because his whole contribution to the Orthodox tradition is to say, look, the life of the spirit is actually beyond words and monuments of tradition and other things. The life of the spirit effectively is the life where the spirit indwells you in such a way that there is a profound transformation. Is that traditional? To the extent to which it, it expresses perhaps the most significant part of our tradition, yes. But it's also not traditional in, uh, again, again there is, there's a kind of a perpetual ambiguity, I think, about the use of tradition. And, and that beautiful discussion that we've just had, I think, I think, uh, I think is, a, is, a good, is a good example of that. So I would simply encourage everybody to kind of reflect on that broader question uh, that Professor Argarata has sort of urged us to think through because it seems pivotal, you know, not only to Hilarion Alfeyev's oeuvre on the subject, but also uh, to the whole to the whole conference. Thanks. So I think with uh, this profound uh, reflection of Paul Gavrilou, we can close the today discussion. Uh, a promising discussion for the continuation of our conference. Uh, so uh, just to remind you that tomorrow we we'll have uh, three papers in the first session. Uh, what time is the bus leaving from the hotel? Nine o'clock. Bus will depart from the bus at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Three papers will be presented in the first session. I would like also to, well, to warmly thank the two ladies and our gentlemen in this session. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the two ladies and Father Sabine. I would also like to thank our interpreters. It looks like they're very helpful in bridging the communication gap between the two languages. And of course, a warm applause to all the staff of the Polos Academy of Theological Studies for their contribution. Because they have been working restlessly and will continue to work in the same way. So, tomorrow we will convene again. Now, we will go for dinner. Christ has risen.